Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Aaron and today I'm bringing you a Formula E show where I've had a conversation with Tom Horrocks from the Monkey Seat Podcast. We've been discussing the first six races of the Formula E Gen 3 era with five different winners from four different teams. It's been an absolutely insane series of races which you've been able to see on this channel through uh, live streams. Uh, there's more coming up for the rest of the season. The next one's in Berlin uh, at the end of April, so make sure you tune in for that. Uh, but for now, I'm going to jump into this chat. I hope you enjoy it, and uh, leave a like, all that good stuff on the video. Subscribe for more Grand Prix content, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. After six races of Gen 3, we've had five different winners from four different teams in Formula E this season, with the most recent three races being action-packed, to say the least. Joining me to discuss the first third of the season is Tom Horrocks. Welcome to the show, Tom. How are you? I'm great, thank you, Aaron. I'm uh, really enjoying this this new this new Gen Three. I didn't think I would when I first saw the uh, the images when they came out, but uh, it's been a bit of a slow burn, but it's uh, certainly picked up in the uh, uh, in the uh, the last couple of races. So it's uh, it, it's it's looking great. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, they did look a bit like Doritos on wheels at some point, but the, the colour schemes have, have done a good job in uh, differentiating the cars quite well. Now, you join us from the Monkey Seat podcast. Tell us about that and also tell us about your involvement with F1 Firesides. Oh, yeah, so I mean, I uh, myself and my friend Carl, we run uh, the Monkey Seat podcast. We uh, we talk about Formula One and occasionally uh, other other sports as well, or other other motorsport categories as well. But we tend to focus on Formula One because uh, that's what we kind of know about more than more than anything. And also trying to get Carl to watch another race is uh, pretty much impossible. Uh, we have a bit of a, a bit of a kind of a bit of an, an uncut vibe to it if if you see what i mean it's uh we, we don't really care too much about uh about what we say and when we say it, we don't be offensive or anything like that but uh we're not we're not too worried about the uh about the about the analytics and monetization and that it's just a bit of fun so if you want to come along and hear two mates just having a laugh and not really caring what people think about us then that's the monkey seat and then the uh that that's the um that's the kind of the dirty weekend. And then we've got the the uh, the, the wife, as you would call it, is the Grid Talk podcast, which is F1 Chronicle, which I uh, I, I host some of their race shows, much more professional, much more, uh, much more PC. And um, and we also do fireside chats there. I recently had a chat with with Chris Medland on uh, on the fireside chats when he uh, he was he was crazy to suggest that Fernando Alonso might win a race this year. And he was, uh, that was before we'd seen any, any action whatsoever. So that's the kind of great content you get on, on F1 firesides. But, uh, but I'm really excited to talk about something a little bit different. We used to talk about Formula E on, uh, on the monkey seat and, uh, and I haven't, I haven't really had a chance to talk about it for a while. So I'm looking forward to, to rolling back the years. It's interesting. You mentioned your chat with Chris Medlin, which first of all was a great interview but when he said about Alonso winning a race this year, I posed that to your fellow Grid Talk host, George Housen, on this show. And, well, there's a there's a clip of it. You can go and watch it on the channel. But it's, he said that Chris had had a bit of a bump. <laughs> so that might explain it. But it was quite a, quite a wild prediction, which, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe he had an inside line. Who knows? Who knows? But... Yeah, let's let's talk about some Formula E and let's change the pace a little bit. So they've had their new generation of car. We've already mentioned they looked a bit funky. But what stood out for you in the opening six rounds of the season? Well, I think to be honest, it's the the, the arrival of McLaren on the scene. And I know it's very easy to say as a, as a big McLaren fan across all motorsport. And uh, but the arrival of McLaren and just those early performances from 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 Jake Hughes and looking like he could be a, a, a potential world champion in those opening races, but just not having the, uh, the the race craft to see it through. And and it's a bit of a shame he's now seems to, to have tailed off. But that was the the thing that really stood out for me. And obviously, you can you've got the the, the dominance of the Porsche and the performances of airline in those opening races was uh was was quite something to see and and but wherever you looked there was something going on there was you, you just saw that the, the the super team of um uh, uh, uh van dorn uh moving moving down there and just not just just not working out with van dorn and thinking he's not going to be able to defend his championship but then it kind of looks like he's going to come good and that's one thing i love about formula e you just never know what's going to happen it's uh you, you one moment you think you've got it pegged and then all of a sudden you know your own comes out of nowhere and throws himself into championship contention and uh so this 
there has been a huge amount that's that's really stood out for me and uh, and I'm really glad because I have to admit I was a little bit pessimistic at the start of the Gen 3 era when there was all these all this stuff about the the brakes not working and and I'll be honest I tuned into the first race of the season expecting to seeing a lot of crashes and uh, and just general carnage and and a series that has kind of let itself down a little bit in the past with the way it presents itself and but it hasn't done that at all. It, it put a fix in place and it was a bit of a risk that first race. I was a bit uncomfortable with uh, with that first race in Daria and, and the way it just seemed like it was a bit of a bit of a risk. But uh, but they got through it. No one got hurt. It was fine. And and since then, it's been uh, it's been a wild ride and it's been really entertaining. It, it really has been entertaining. And if, if you like Formula E like we do, you can always join me for live watch alongs for each of the races. And they, they've been really good fun. Really, I must say, I've been thoroughly, thoroughly impressed with the with the action. I think the last three races have been just incredible. And like you say, the, the really refreshing thing about it, because we're both longtime Formula One fans and F1's going through a phase of another dominant period for Red Bull off the back of many years of dominance by Mercedes, not without competition within that. Obviously, Inter-Team and then Ferrari were... We're close for a little bit, but we've been through these cycles. Formula E doesn't seem to have this cycle of domination. You get it for like 20 minutes and then someone's up your rear trying to chase you down and, and take the win from you. And there was the, the, the quote of commentary that uh, Jack Nichols used in the last race in Sao Paulo is, it's about a million for the lead at one point. It was just fantastic. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's classic Jack Nichols, isn't it? Just He's watching it as a fan. We're watching it. We don't believe what we're seeing. The, the the action can fluctuate so much. And you've got a driver who looks comfortable in the lead, but he's got to manage his energy. And there might be someone behind who's done their energy saving and is closing up really quickly. It's not easy to overtake this year, but that's really good because we don't see these attack mode drive-bys anymore, like we do with DRS in Formula One. I think that is really refreshing that... The sheer variety, and I mentioned it in the intro, five different winners, only one repeat winner, which is Pascal Verlein, four different teams. Jaguar could have won three of these races, but they've only got one victory, which came in Sao Paulo. But we've had so many different drivers on pole. Jake Hughes has been on pole for McLaren. And okay, they're the Mercedes winning team of the last two years, but it's still essentially a new team, the way they're running it. And that's a new driver who's never driven Formula E. And he's, like you said, been fantastic they don't have the points to show for their speed but they have done such a solid job so far and this was something i was going to come to later in the show but because you brought mclaren up let's let's start with them we're both big mclaren fans they have been absolutely excellent i for one am thoroughly impressed with the job they've done yeah i i've been impressed as well and they've certainly shown shown the speed there and that's to be expected given what they came from obviously they're, they're a new team but you know they're very much uh very much the mercedes eq team of old but uh i've been a little bit disappointed with their with their race sharpness with regards to strategy i think there's there's been a couple of times when i thought they they could have potentially done better um and i've not been I've not been that impressed with 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 Rene Rast. I thought he was going to be really, really good and and a great barometer for for Jake Hughes. But I, I think he's he's let himself down a little bit in a couple of races, and Jake Hughes hasn't quite had the experience to to push forward. But uh, and and with a little bit of ring rust in there as well for 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 the McLaren team and from a strategy side of things, I think they genuinely could be a lot higher than than they are. Um, it's just been a little bit of bad luck, a little bit of inexperience from from Hughes, and a little bit of uh, rustiness from from Rast. But but certainly for a new team coming into Formula E, they've you know they've hit the ground running. You know, new power unit, new you know, new new personnel. Um, although you know the core of it still being the same as Mercedes EQ, but uh, they've they've certainly got a bright future in Formula E, and uh, and uh, and I'm I'm here for it. I'm definitely here for it. They've done a really good job. And I think that the one point that they need to improve on is their race sort of execution. They've not had the energy management. They've not had the the, strat the strategical side of things locked down. But the speed has been there. They've been there or thereabouts sort of around the top teams. They're six in the constructor or the team's championship at the moment behind Avalanche Andretti and Diaz Penske, who have kind of fluctuated in their performance levels, but crucially have victories for one of their drivers in Jake Dennis and um, John Eric Verne. 
So for McLaren to be there is really, really impressive. And those two, well, Jake Hughes especially, will be learning with every single race that he does. I was never convinced that Rene Rast was the right driver to be leading that team because he's been in the sport before and he's a very middle-of-the-road Formula E driver. If you were going to make a real statement, you'd, they'd, they could have kept Van Dorn, ex-McLaren, of course, in Formula 1. That would have been, you know, the barometer, the current world champion. But obviously, Antonio Felix da Costa was on the market. I don't know how how late into the day the McLaren deal came through or whether they could have pinched him, but he's ended up at Porsche and is looking like a potential world champion again. But Rani Rast is... It's kind of how good is Rene Rast? How good is Jake Hughes? Because they're fairly evenly matched. They're separated by eight points in the in the team in the, in the drivers. Even <laughs> all these different words. Um, but yeah, Rast has got a podium. Uh, has Jake Hughes? I don't think he's got a podium yet. No, I'm pretty sure he hasn't. I don't think he uh, has. I'd have to um, double check that, but I'm pretty sure he hasn't. Yeah, but he he's had some really good performances. Obviously, that crash in Hyderabad where the bit of mirror got stuck behind the wheel and he mm. could no longer turn. That was really unfortunate, but that's, unfortunately, that is racing. So we, we talked about McLaren, and there's been three new tracks as well as a new team. Hyderabad, Cape Town, and Sao Paulo have been the most recent three races, Tom. Which one of those did you enjoy the most? I've enjoyed all three of them for different reasons, and that's massive fence sitting right there. And I promise I will make a I, I will make a definitive choice in a moment. But uh, but yeah, I think that the racing at, at Hyderabad was um, w- was much better than the people expected, and uh, and Cape Town was just was just was just a gorgeous location, and and uh, and Sao Paulo was 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 just really interesting on on all levels, and just just a, just a great race as well. And and I think I think for me, I wasn't expecting a lot from Hyderabad. So I think probably that has been my favourite of the tracks so far on that front. But um, but I think Sao Paulo was the best race for me. So again, I, I said I would be definitive and I haven't been definitive at all. So I apologise for that. So if you're going to tell me I have to pick one, then I'd say probably Sao Paulo. But uh, but um, but yeah, all three have been have been really, really interesting and uh, and exceeded my expectations. I was kind of expecting... I thought, you know, with the cars going a lot faster now and dirty air is going to start to become a thing in Formula E and aerodynamics are going to start to play a little bit of a little bit of a path. It's inevitable. It's always going to happen because, you know, they're they're vying to be, you know, a much faster formula and you can't change the laws of physics. It's always going to be a it's always going to create a problem. Um, physics it's just it's just going to happen um but they've dealt with it quite well they're still having great races the fact that the cars are slightly smaller as well as helped and and that's really nice and refreshing to see that you know, they you know they they're able to you know with the advanced technology they're able to to make these cars slightly smaller and um and push on but um i've completely diverged away from your actual <laughs> question and, and just started ranting about other things again as usual which is it's very much on brand for me but uh but yeah i'll, I'll just go it off and again as i said that i think probably I'll, I'll go sao paulo as an answer to your question but uh but yeah it's been it's been a wild ride and I, i've thoroughly enjoyed it they've been really excellent i think they've been well they've been more enjoyable than the opening three rounds which were tracks that the series had visited before and obviously uh Diria was a double header and each of the three new races has their merits. Hyderabad had a really tense finish battle for the lead, the collision between the Jaguar drivers. It was the first of a really sort of almost like a velodrome indie style with the really long straights. Um, Cape Town, like you said, an amazing location. But I think the challenge of that uh, turn eight, nine section where Antonio Felix da Costa made that race winning move was really important because obviously the, the cars are going much faster now being able to deal with that we saw a couple of accidents in qualifying there which uh, took out Edo Motara and Sam Bird so the challenge was still there and it was a really fascinating race because you couldn't really tell who was going to win it until well until Da Costa made the move in the added laps at the Fergie time of, of motorsport which I think is a I'm not sure if I com- I completely agree with it, but who who, who cares? It gave us a, a, an exciting finish to a race, and obviously the Sao Paulo race was completely different. It was more like a peloton race in in cycling. You didn't want to be the guy at the front. No one wanted to win the race. <laughs> it was really really weird. So Van Dorn was just like 
do you want to do you want to go through i think it was da costa was like not really and then cassie's like oh, yeah i'll go in the lead and then realized no i don't want to be here this is bad for me <laughs> so i'll just fall back everyone go past it was fascinating to watch i, I enjoyed all of them but if i had to pick one i probably oh, Cape Town, I think just for that pass by Da Costa, mm. it was just outrageously good. And he even admitted that he probably shouldn't have gone for it, which makes it all the more impressive because if he'd got it wrong, they're you know crashing into a concrete wall and everyone else is behind them. That's not going to end well, but all's well that ends well. It was a fascinating duel. We've seen those two go wheel to wheel, uh, Da Costa and Vern go wheel to wheel before and it end in tears. So, you know, kudos to them for, for getting the job done. And in that race as well, Pascal Verlein uh, picked up his only DNF of the season so far. But he is also the only repeat winner with the two wins in uh, Diria. And he leads the championship by 24 points from Jake Dennis, who won the opening race. But his relative consistency is keeping him at the top of the standings. How impressed have you been with Pascal Verlein's performances this year and do you think it's likely that the German can carry them forward for the rest of the year I think he's definitely the favorite and uh it's it's disappointing that after such a great start but then he's tailed away just the, the 12 points um 12 points in uh, in Saudi and then the uh and then the uh you know, six points in Sao Paulo and, and zero points in Cape Town it's um uh, sorry not Sao it was, it was India wasn't it the uh the, the 12 points but um it's after that drop off, you really kind of wanted to see Jake Dennis push on and really make a fight for this championship, but he scored no points in those three races, and it's it's he still maintained the gap. But then you've got Cassidy and and John Eric Verne and and De Costa as well have thrown themselves back in with Bird really showing some form as well, and and I genuinely think that we could have a title battle here, but I just think that he's got. He's, I mean, what's he got? Twenty-four point lead over Jake Dennis. How Jake Dennis is still second in that championship, I have got no idea. Uh, what I do, he's, he got those three great results in the first few, three races, but uh, he's had some bad luck. And I do think that that Fairline has got the package that that can win the race and he's uh, win the championship, and he's definitely got the talent as well. Um, I'm just here for a bit more of what was my favourite quote of the season so far, which was the great British Jake off. I'm just more of that. I want to see more <laughs> of uh, more of Hughes and Dennis battling on uh, battling, but at the front would be nice as well. And for the sake of the championship, I'd, I'd love it to be, you know, a, a four or five way fight for the championship. And then, you know, the last couple of races, one will drop off, one will drop off, and then you've got a head-to-head at the final. I don't like to see like six people going for the championship in the last race like we did in uh, in uh, 2021, and uh, uh, that was a bit too far for me, I think. But I don't think we'll see that again now that they've changed the uh, now they've changed the qualifying format. I think you will see the the natural order kind of progressing and in, in a much more kind of fundamental uh, sporting way because it was a bit. It was a bit NASCAR lottery for me before I was kind of losing a bit of bit of the will with it. And I'm really glad they changed the qualifying system to to what they have now. I think it's exciting. I think it's dynamic. I think it's uh, it's it's unpredictable, but it still rewards great driving. And it's not just about, you know, if you're on track at the right time and, and that kind of thing. So. So, yeah, um, answer to your question once again. Yeah, I think Verlein is still is still the favourite for the championship. And uh, I think there's he's not his luck isn't going to carry on as bad as it has been. He's definitely going to he's definitely going to get back on the top spot again this year. Well, like you say about the qualifying, the, 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 the previous format where the top six or seven drivers in the championship went out first and then it went out with the, the drivers lower in the order, like. In theory, that's good because it gives the drivers lower down an opportunity to get back into the fight. But it did become a little bit too wild, especially if you had a wet, dry qualifying. I think there was one in Rome where all the drivers in the top of, top uh, group, first group, had to go on a soaking wet track. And you had someone who's like an ultimate last in the, the, the championship on pole position, which just doesn't really make much sense. But now you get a bit more of a story of the season. You get If you look at the championship, you can see the drivers that are doing well. Obviously, uh, Verline's got the, the big lead at the cha- top of the championship, but Jake Dennis is still up there because he had those solid points performances and, then the, and the win, early doors. Nick Cassidy, I, I looked at the standings earlier. I couldn't believe he was third, but he's finished on the podium in the last three races. So, you know, the, a little bit of consistency there. Um, 
Vern obviously got a win. De Costa's been on fire the last few races. He struggled early on. Bird's been good. Obviously, Mitch Evans is quick, but he's not had things go his way. He's only ninth in the in the, in the championship. So it does look a bit more meritorious in, in terms of the way it's all coming together now. And I think you're right. Verline is in the pound seat. He's currently the favourite, obviously, because he's got a, a nice 24-point cushion. But that can easily change. And I, I think there's a lot of drivers who are going to be looking at themselves and going, I can be the one to challenge him. And I think there's one person in particular who will be looking at himself closest and going, yeah, I, I can absolutely catch him. But Because there's, there's four drivers, second, third, fourth and fifth, who are covered by just four points. That's Dennis, Cassidy, Verne and De Costa. And Sam Bird's back on 44. So who do you see making the big challenge? Who should Verline be most concerned about? Well, I think you can't ignore the pace that Jake Dennis showed in the first part of the season. And uh, as I said before, his luck is going to change, but so is Verlines. I think those two are going to be the two. And, you know, Nick Cassidy has shown shown great consistency in the last few races and, and great speed as well. And, and, you know, could potentially have had a race win as well. Um, I mean, you can't ignore the experience of Jeff and DaCosta, but I think it's, for me, it's still going to be Dennis is going to be the one that's going to push it. He very nearly won the championship in 21 and an unlucky season last year. I think he's got a point to prove. I think Jake Dennis is going to be the one there to, uh, to, to challenge Fairline. But uh, if I'm, if I'm a betting man, um, then my money's definitely going on, on the Porsche. 100%. Now, you see, I, I think uh, Verline's biggest concern should be uh, De Costa because he's got the same car. And if Verline doesn't put it together, we've seen him put it together on a couple of occasions this season, but we've also seen him not put it together. And De Costa is a very accomplished driver. He probably should have got his chance in Formula One, but he's shown his quality in Formula E. And he has got a lot of experience. Obviously, Verline has two, but De Costa has that championship winning experience. I, I don't recall Verline being in a title fight in Formula E. So that pressure could tell, OK, it's we're only midway through the season, not even that yet. But by the time we get to Rome, if Verline doesn't have that cushion or has had a poor run of results, I, I'm not sure he can turn it around even though he's looking the favourite at the moment, his consistency has been good. But obviously, we, we, if you take Jensen Button in 2009, great start to the year, won six of the first seven races. Then it all got a little bit tight, all a bit squeaky, and he just got himself over the line. Maybe Verline pulls that sort of you know, rabbit out of the hat. But De Costa, I think, with that championship win behind him, he's won plenty of races in the series. He's in good form. I think he's the one that we should be looking at to potentially put on the biggest challenge. But then there's there's challenges that can come from outside. Envision have looked good. Sebastian Buemi's been decent on a few occasions this season. And Cassidy's in a good run of form at the moment. Jaguar have a very good package. They just haven't put it together. So there's no reason why potentially Sam Bird or Mitch Evans can't get involved. That, that, for me, is the big, you know, that's where the season is coming. Next, how do Jaguar get themselves back up the order? Because they've won the last race, and they could have won all of the last three, but they haven't. I think they've been probably the biggest disappointment so far. What would you say to that? Yeah, I think they've definitely shown, they've definitely shown strength, Jaguar, and, and they've, their power unit looks really, really strong, and having that uh, was it one, two, three in, in in the last race as well. That that's that's huge for for the brand as well, and that's a huge, huge, uh, huge thing for for Jaguar as a as a company. It's something that not a lot of people tend to achieve. I think it's I'm right in saying it's only ever happened once before where you've had the uh, the um, uh, the same engine or the same power unit, sorry, has locked out the podium. Only other time was when Mercedes and was it Venturi came one, two, three, four in a race a couple of years ago. Um, so that's that's that strength definitely. And and they've got two great drivers there. And Sam Bird vastly experienced in Formula E. He's Mr. Formula E. Uh, Mitch Evans, great talent, very much a match for Sam Bird as well. And uh, 
couple of podiums to, uh, to to Bird's name as well there, and uh, and of course uh, you've got a win there for Evans as well. So um, they're definitely a strong team. I think they are one of the strongest lineups as well. It's it's good. It's it's very um, it, it's very stupid what you say about Verline there, and and he's not really his junior career is not really littered with championships as well. It's not like it's something that he's not like he's got a formula two world championship and a formula three championship to his name or anything like that. He's, he's, he's just got a DTM championship and, and, and that's it. And, and uh, DTM wasn't particularly competitive at the time. He kind of got into formula one, got his chance and, uh, and lived off the reputation of that and went into formula E and um, is right place, right time now. So it's, um, I just think that the guy is a talented driver and I think that he he uh, he probably will have a bit too much. But uh, we'll see. It's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. But but yeah, Jaguar, I think Jaguar have got a chance to come back and fight for the team's championship. I think that they're, they're a bit far off at the moment, but uh, but it's not to say that they won't, you know, that I think they're going to be probably the the top scoring team in the, in the tail end of the season. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I think Envision are, are doing well to be sitting there, but I can't see them staying there. And there's certainly Jagger will be up there for second and uh, pushing for that first place. I think as well. It's going to be a, a, a big fight towards the end of the season because you, obviously, like you say, Jagger have got to get themselves up there. And I think they're a good bet, like you say, for the team's championship because they've got two drivers who are delivering very well. But Porsche potentially have two drivers who can do the same. The next round is in Berlin, uh, pretty much a staple hold of the Formula E calendar, where they run it one way one day, and then they run it in reverse the next day. And of course, they held it six times in 2020, because it was the only place they could do it uh, because of COVID. So all, most of the drivers should be fairly familiar with that. And it's quite, quite an interesting layout, generally lots of action. What are you looking forward to about that race? I'm looking forward to actually seeing uh, a, a Berlin E-Prix because I've never actually seen a, a full Berlin E-Prix live. And uh, I, I've seen highlights from from most of them. I didn't see any of the 2020 action at all. I've not seen any of that. Um, just never got around to watching it. So the um, I'm actually looking forward to seeing a Tempelhof E-Prix. So that's the that's the thing for me. I want to see all the fuss is about. So, <laughs> yeah, and the fact it's very Mario Kart, isn't it? It's very right. OK, swing it into reverse and see what happens. So it's going to be fun fascinating to see what happens i wish that i wish that formula one and other sports as well would would, would lean into this as well a little bit i know you've got gravel traps and things and, and safety concerns to come into effect but some of these countries that are that have got these tracks they they spend so much money on them just just plan ahead you know plan ahead for a for a reverse race and just do it just do it why not we, we can have it in formula one we can have them going backwards around silverstone and uh, for a sprint race around silverstone backwards yeah that'd be great That'd be fantastic. So I'd love to see it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that from um from Temple Hop as well. I think that that's gonna be uh that's gonna be fun to see. So I'm very much a uh a uh I, I don't know much about the Berlin E Pre at all. So this is something that um you know, home race as well for Verline, so home race for Porsche. Um they're gonna wanna get some big points on the board there. So the the fight between Porsche and um and everyone else trying to keep up, I think that's going to be that's going to be really interesting for the next next few races. It'd be interesting to see how Porsche do because they've won obviously the the only three races that have been held on tracks that were previously on the Formula E calendar: Hyderabad, Cape Town, Sao Paulo, all new, all won by different teams and different drivers. Berlin is a, obviously, as I mentioned, a track that's been on Formula E's calendar before. Let, this could be a really good sort of benchmark for where Porsche are in their development of their their powertrain, how that what they've learned, and where the other teams are in terms of getting their act together. Because Porsche won the first three races at a canter. It was almost embarrassing for the for the rest of the field, especially in Deria, where Verline and Dennis started way outside the top 10 and still finished first and second in both races. So it's a similar sort of vibe to Diria, twisty with a little bit of high speed so how the porsche deals with that versus perhaps the jaguar the nissan powertrain has been pretty good in the back of the the mclaren and in the nissan of course <laughs> um so it'd be very interesting from, from that point of view so there's lots to look forward to i think the rest of the season we've got one two three four five six different countries left to visit and just a, something I, I 
uh, stumbled upon while looking through the calendar, Monaco and uh, Jakarta's Indonesia, I believe, uh, they actually have exactly the same flag, save for maybe a little bit of shade on the red, which was yeah. really like, have they just made a mistake? But no, I don't think they've made a mistake because it's on there twice. It's the same flag. So yeah, that, that will be fun with, with trying to work out which country they're in. But it's going to be a really interesting rest of the season. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Just remind us where we can find uh, more from you on motorsport, on the YouTube and the, everywhere. Well, yeah, you can you can follow the, the Monkey Seat Podcast. Just go onto YouTube and search for Monkey Seat Podcast. You'll find us there. Uh, we're at Monkey Seat Pods on the on the socials and monkeyseatpod.com is the website. I am at Tom Horrocks F1. Uh, I do talk about other stuff as well as F1, but uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's me on Twitter if you want to get in touch with me there. I'm not on True Social, I'm afraid, so you'll have to just uh, not not find me on there, I'm afraid. Uh, but that's kind of me. And also look at F1 Grid Talk as well because they do some great work, Grid Talk. They're you know, really growing very, very fast and uh, I love being part of that community. So uh, give them a look as well. Yeah, I second that because I'm part of that community as well. Uh, just before this, we've recorded another Fireside show, uh, which you hosted and I was a guest on. And it's always a great fun time coming onto the Grid Talk podcast. And I've watched and listened to the Monkey Seat Pod. It's, <laughs> it's a good laugh. You're never quite sure uh, where Carl is going to be coming to you. From. <laughs> there was one point where he came to us literally from his car and you spent half the show talking about some woman who was walking around outside his car. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of random tangent you get on the monkey seat and uh yeah um uh, he's uh carl is very much on the spectrum as like i am with regards to a lot of things and we're very much oh squirrel let's just talk about that for a minute so <laughs> if you want a wild ride like formula e and but you want to talk about formula one then come and check us out on the monkey seat <laughs> excellent it's always a really really fun listen and uh if you get to to watch it it's always done live so you can interact with tom and carl on the live stream Ask Carl about George Russell. He's a big fan. Loves George Russell. Massive, massive George Russell fan. Massive George, George, Russell George fan, Russell's yeah. number one fan. Yeah, yeah. And you can, of course, find more from me here on this channel. Uh, so obviously we've got live streams. We've got uh, driver ratings. We're keeping the content coming out despite the lean period of racing action. Um, we've got a double header in Berlin. So the 22nd and 23rd of April be a couple of live stream watch alongs of the e there. Um, so yeah, that'll be that's the checkered flag coming down on this show. My thanks to Tom for joining me, and uh, my thanks to you for for watching or listening. Leave a like on the video, give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe for more Grand Prix content, and we'll see you again very soon.